Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to come together once again and open up your word. Lord, we first and foremost ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit in each one of our hearts right now. Bless us with that spiritual discernment that we must have to understand your spiritual truth. And we pray that you would bless your servant right now as he presents this truth to you as you would reveal it to him. And Lord, help us to have the clarity of mind and understanding of what you would have us to learn at this time. Again, we ask for your presence and we thank you that we can open your word together and study in Jesus name. Amen. Brother Duane did some research and the midnight cry, if we're going to put a date on it, August 12th, 1844. And when he told me that, I said, well, it's the seventh month movement and he quickly pointed out seventh month Jewish calendar. Um, I can't believe that things have went so well. <laughs> As we decided we were going to have this prophecy school, it wasn't that many weeks ago, um, putting everything together. Um, I used to do participate in camp meetings with the video man, Glenn. And Glenn told me something about camp meetings. He had did several before I ever did any. And he said, do you remember this, Glenn? He said, yeah. okay, camp meetings are like there's a train and you're trying to catch it and you start running trying to catch it and you almost get to the caboose and you're struggling and you get on the caboose and you grab it and you're getting up on the train and about the time you get up on it, the camp meeting's over. And we've been running full speed ahead and suddenly the camp meet, this meeting starts and we're over halfway through. And there hasn't really been any big problems. And you, usually there's some big problems. And I hope, uh, from what I'm hearing, it seems like all of us are being blessed by this. I want you to know that we are. Um, this is uh, amazing that it's going so well in so many different ways. Um, on so, set short notice, and people coming from so far away. Um, but anyway, the, the, I think the only problem that I'm aware of is the person that put my PowerPoint presentation together needs some training before we do this again. Um, but we're taking up the second part of the daily. <clears throat> we looked at the history last time and uh, now we're going to start trying to uh, dissect, dissect the daily um, in the book of Daniel. I mentioned earlier on that in Daniel some of the arguments that take place have to do with um, words that appear two times such as um, vision, take away, um, and this is another one we're starting with. If you look on the screen, Kodesh and Mikdash, I may be pronouncing that wrong, are two words in the writings of Daniel that are both translated as sanctuary. And of course, Kodesh um, is only used in the Bible for God's sanctuary, whether it's his earthly sanctuary or his heavenly sanctuary, whereas Mikdash um, is used for God's sanctuary, but it can also be used for pagan sanctuaries. And here's the places on the screen where we can find um, these two words translated simply as sanctuary in the King James Version, Daniel 8.11 the place of his sanctuary um, is Mikdash, uh, and it can be God's sanctuary or a pagan sanctuary. It's up to the context of the verse to um, determine that for us. Verse 13, only two verses later, um, the word sanctuary there is Kodesh, and this is only God's sanctuary. So for me, <clears throat> that means Daniel was using two different Hebrew words on purpose. If he wanted God's sanctuary to be identified in verse 11, he's going to be using the same word that he used in verses 13 and 14. Verses 13 and 14, as you see on the screen, um, that can only be God's sanctuary. Verse 11 must be something other than God's sanctuary. And then, of course, in uh, Daniel 9:26. It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. What is that prophecy about? 
the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of God's sanctuary. And therefore, it's Kodesh. But when we get to Daniel 11, verse 31, it says, An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary. This is the sanctuary that can either be a pagan sanctuary or God's sanctuary. And by Daniel's overall use of the word, I would say that this is obviously not God's sanctuary in this verse. Um, so, in Daniel 8.11, let me see where I'm going with this in my thoughts. Daniel 8.11, 8, we've discussed this a little bit, so I'm going to move past this page and go right over to here. Daniel's distinction. In Daniel 8, he makes a distinction between Kazon and Mor Moray uh, that are both translated vision. One's the entire vision, the other's a snapshot of the vision. And the question that I raise is, Daniel being care careless with his choice of words, or is he being purposeful? in his choice of words. Education, page 123, says, every principle in the word of God has its place, every fact its bearing. And the complete structure in design and execution bears testimony to its author. Such a structure, no mind but that of the infinite could conceive or fashion. Take away. We find two different Hebrew words used as take away. In Daniel 8.11 it says, by him the daily sacrifice was taken away. And in Daniel 11.31, shall take away the da daily sacrifice. In Daniel 12.11, from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. There are two different Hebrew words that are translated as take away in these three verses. In uh, Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11, it's the same Hebrew word um, that is translated as take away. In Daniel 8.11, it is a different Hebrew word that's translated as take away. In Daniel 8.11, the word is rum or rum. You see it's spelled there, and it's missing um, an accent mark, a Hebrew accent mark that is unimportant to our study. Um, and in Daniel 11 and Daniel 12, the word translated as take away is sir. And the rum, uh, its definition is to lift up and exalt. Sir is to remove. Both these words are used in the sanctuary. Um, rum uh, being used in the sanctuary in the Old Testament where it's dealing with sanctuary service. Uh, you'll find the word rum used when the, the priest would lift up and exalt a wave sheaf offering. This is the word that's used. So there is a sense that it's removed. If the wave sheaf offering is down here and it's lifted up and exalted, it's removed from here to there. But it's a, it's a, it's a stretch to really make that hold if you're going to look at the word closely, particularly if we're going to look at it how Daniel uses it, which we are going to do. Whereas sir is used in the sanctuary service to identify when the ashes were removed from the altar of offering, and it means to remove. And to remove and to lift up and exalt are two different definitions. Um, in Daniel 11.31, Daniel 12.11, um, it means to remove. So we'll put that word in these verses, in verse 31 of Daniel 11. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and they shall remove the daily, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. And in verse 11 of Daniel 12, and from the time that the daily shall be removed, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. The abomination that maketh desolate is the papacy. Now, in um, these two places where it's translated as remove, we, you see those reflected on the screen, and uh, we're going to substitute in here now the papacy because uh, we know that the abomination of desolation has been pap is the papacy. And it says, an arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary's strength, and they shall remove the daily, and they shall place the papacy. And from the time that the daily shall be removed, and the papacy set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. As I've already mentioned a couple times, and I don't sense, usually, usually if you have a group this size in Adventism, from my experience, you have a few people that are tempted or firmly committed to reapplying 
the time prophecies of Daniel 12 at the end of the world. I haven't picked up any of that from this particular group, praise the Lord. But because of that, because of this tape, who knows where these tapes will go, I'm going to emphasize again that um, the daily of verse 31 is the same symbol as verse 11 in Daniel 12, and there is no internal evidence or reason or justification to make a distinction between these identical words that are used in the very same vision. That's the same vision. If Daniel's going to suddenly use the same word and expect us to understand that it's symbolizing something different, which it's just what is, what's 31 from 45? That's 14 plus 11. That'd be what? 25 verses later, we're going to believe that the same word daily that Daniel used back in verse 31, 25 verses later, that same word daily, is, we're supposed to understand that it symbolizes something different than 25 verses earlier. I don't think so. They're both located in the identical vision. Let's continue on with the arms of verse 31. Military power or support. Uh, this is Uriah Smith again. And the emperors of Rome, the Eastern Division, which still continued, had intelligence or connived with the Church of Rome. Now remember in verse 30, that's how verse 30 of Daniel 11 closes up, is that pagan Rome had intelligence with them that forsook the Holy Covenant. That phrase in verse 30, in my mind, is important to understand because that's talking about when pagan Rome is at the, at the very end of their intelligence, but it's identifying that they had interaction with the papacy, and from that point on in the flow of verses, it's the papacy that's the subject of the verses. But more than that, pagan Rome... Um, is paralleling the role of the United States, and it's teaching us, if we will understand it, that pagan Rome placed the papacy on the throne of the earth through its military power, and the power that places the papacy on the throne of the earth at the end through their military power is the United States. Therefore, at some point in history, there would be intelligence that took place between the United States and the Vatican. Okay, that, and we, we hopefully we know where... where when that took place in the Ronald Reagan years. And of course, it was taking place before then. But who was it that finally got an ambassador um, to the papacy, an, an official one for the United States? It was Ronald Reagan. Harry S. Truman tried it in 1950, I believe, and the Protestant churches in the United States raised such a protest that he withdrew his nomination. But by the time Ronald Reagan came along, it was ratified with the Christians of the United States saying amen. That was the, the start of the intelligence. But back to what we're dealing with. And the emperors of Rome, the Eastern Division, which still continued, had intelligence or connived with the Church of Rome, which had forsaken the covenant and constituted the great apostasy for the purpose of putting down heresy. The man of sin was raised to his presumptuous throne by the defeat of the Arian Goths, who then held possession of Rome in A.D. 538. Verse 31 quoted, The power of the empire was committed to the carrying on of the work before mentioned. The power of the empire is the military power of pagan Rome was committed to the carrying on of the work before mentioned. Verse 31 starts with the phrase, and arms shall stand on his part. So it's dealing with arms in verse 31. Military power. And arms, the military power of pagan Rome, shall stand on his part. And they, the arms, shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And they, the arms, shall remove the daily. And they, the arms, shall place the papacy. The arms do four things in this verse. They stand, they pollute, they remove, and they place the papacy. You see that? His, the papacy. Stand on his part. Who are they, who are they standing up for? The papacy. And the emperors of Rome had intelligence or connived with the church of Rome, which had forsaken the Holy Covenant. The his in this verse, verse 31, is the papacy. And the military power of pagan Rome shall stand up for the papacy. And the military power of pagan Rome shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, shall remove the daily, and shall place the papacy. If you're not noticing it, we're just going through and attempting to dissect this verse. Four actions from... From the year 496 through 538, pagan Rome stood up militarily for the papacy. And in doing so, pagan Rome polluted the sanctuary of strength, removed the daily by 508, 
and place the papacy in 538. And if you remember, and I know it's been a busy week, if you remember when we were reading Uriah Smith, and I probably have it on one of the next slides, but when we were reading Uriah Smith, he, he gave two possibilities for the polluting of the sanctuary of strength. He says the sanctuary of the strength for pagan Rome was the city of Rome, and whether this verse is identifying when the barbarians, the trumpet powers, began to take uh, Western Rome apart and actually conquered and came to control the city of Rome. When was the city of Rome finally taken control of fully by the barbarians? March 476. We're talking about West, Western Rome. The, the trumpet powers had taken control of Western Rome by 476. And Uriah Smith says whether that was the polluting or the destruction or the tearing up of the city of Rome or whether it was the fact that Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire from the city of Rome to Constantinople. Either one of those two scenarios, and, and a third scenario that is offered is that during the final battle for the city of Rome in 538, the, the military destruction that took place as the Goths were finally drove away from the city of Rome. That's how the sanctuary of the strength was polluted. So I don't have a date in there because you could put 330, uh, you could put the time period of the trumpets, um, or you could put 538. Pagan Rome polluted the sanctuary of strength. The sanctuary of strength, 4720, that's Mikdash, not Kodesh. I have very dogmatically, this is not God's sanctuary because in my simple mind, when I see Daniel using two words that get translated as one word in the King James Version, and I go back and see that he was using two words, that means he's making a distinction here. And Daniel's very familiar with the Hebrew word that can only be used to identify God's sanctuary. So when I see him using a different word for sanctuary, that tells me that isn't God's sanctuary. And, of course, I also have the benefit of trusting in a general sense, the pioneers of Adventism, and they will tell you the sanctuary of strength is the city of Rome. And this is Uriah Smith doing so. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, or Rome. If this applies to the barbarians, it was literally fulfilled, for Rome was sacked by the Goths and the Vandals, and the imperial power of the West ceased through the conquest of Rome by Odiacer. Or if it refers to those rulers of the empire who were working in behalf of the papacy against pagan and all other opposing religions, it would signify the removal of the seat of the empire from Rome to Constantinople, which contributed to its measure of influence to the downfall of Rome. This passage would then be parallel to Daniel 8.11 and Revelation 13.2. So what am I saying? I'm saying that when they pollute the sanctuary of strength in verse 31, they pollute the city of Rome. And um, in the city of Rome, in terms of Bible prophecy, I don't think that we've come to understand fully all the prophetic, the prophetic significance of the city of Rome when it comes to Rome and pagan and papal. But in verse 24, we've read through this a couple times already. Uh, in verse 24 of Daniel 11, we see the time prophecy for how long pagan Rome would rule the world and... And there was a question raised here after we, at some point in this prophecy school, the last phrase of verse 24 says, Yea, and he, that's pagan Rome, according to the pioneers, he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And the question was raised because we'd already read this quote once, we'll read it again. The question is, uh, was brought to me this way, sort of, uh, you, uh, pioneers, are both saying that this strongholds is the stronghold singular of the city of Rome, and you're saying that this word against is better understood as from, because this is how the pioneers understood it. They, they're saying that pagan Rome was to broadcast or uh, control the empire of Rome from the stronghold of the city of Rome, and if the pioneers, or what I'm teaching is correct, how come it is strongholds in the plural? And my answer was, that's one I don't know. But here's, what the, pioneer, here's the pioneer position on it. It says, the latter portion of this verse, Bishop Newton gives the idea of forecasting devices from strongholds instead of against them. This the Romans did from the strong fortress of their seven-hilled city, even for a time, doubtless, 
prophetic time, 360 years. From, from what point are these years to be dated? Probably from the event brought to view in the following verse. So the stronghold of Rome, Revelation 13, 2, we've referred to more than once, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and a great authority. The stronghold of Rome is a theme of prophecy. Rome, the city, is a theme of prophecy. Pagan Rome gave the seat of its political authority to the papacy in the year 330. And, of course, Uriah Smith, continuing on, says the battle was fought beginning the 12th, the 360-year time period. The battle was fought September 2nd, B.C. 31, at the mouth of the Gulf of Ambracia near the city of Actium. This battle doubtless marks the commencement of the time in verse 24, and as during this time devices were to be forecast from the stronghold or Rome, we should conclude that at the end of that period, Western supremacy would cease or such a change take place in the empire that the city would no longer be considered the seat of government. Now, is in terms of sanctuary, Daniel 8, 11, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Brothers and sisters, two verses later, in verse 13, and three verses later, in verse 14, Daniel uses Kodesh, for, that it, and it's translated sanctuary, just like it's Mikdash is translated sanctuary here in verse 11. This is once again telling my simple mind that Daniel is saying that this sanctuary here in verse 11 is not God's sanctuary. If Daniel had wanted us to understand it was God's sanctuary, it would have been Kodesh. Why would, he, why would anyone do that? Why would anyone do it if that's what they were trying to convey, that here in verse 11 this was God's sanctuary, when two verses later he's being very distinct about God's sanctuary. So... From verses 11 through 14, Daniel uses two different Hebrew words that are both translated sanctuary in the King James Version. And, and I think I've already summarized that rather than reading it. And I would suggest to you that here in verse 11, he's identifying a pagan sanctuary. And uh, in uh, Uriah Smith, commenting on this, says, and the place of his sanctuary or worship, the city of Rome. The seat of government was removed by Constantine in AD 330 to Constantinople. This same transaction is brought to view in Revelation 13, 2, where it is said the dragon, pagan Rome, gave to the beast, papal Rome, his seat, the city of Rome. So what am I getting at here? I'm trying to nail down what the sanctuary is of strength um, for pagan Rome, the empire of pagan Rome, and it was the city of Rome that was their sanctuary of strength and the story about um, the city of Rome runs throughout Bible prophecy, whether it's in Revelation 13, 2, 11, 31 of Daniel, or 8, 11 of Daniel. That sanctuary is the sanctuary uh, that gets cast down by pagan Rome in 330, and Constantinople is chosen above it. Review and Herald, January 1858. This, this is not... Uriah Smith, this is a pioneer called Apollos Hell, and this is his comment. What can be meant by the sanctuary of paganism? Paganism and every an error of every kind have their sanctuaries as well as truth. There are temples or asylums consecrated to their service. Some particular and renowned temple of paganism may then be supposed to be here spoken of, and he's speaking about Daniel 8.11. Which of the numerous distinguished temples may it be? One of the most magnificent specimens of classic architecture is called the Pantheon. Its name signifies the temple or asylum of the gods. The place of its location is Rome. And that's what the verse says. It doesn't say his sanctuary is cast down. It says the place of his sanctuary is cast down. The idols of the nations conquered by the Romans were sacredly deposited in some niche or department of this temple and in many cases became objects of worship by the Romans themselves. Could we find a temple of paganism that more strikingly is his sanctuary? I believe that should read. Um, the custom or the, the tradition of pagan Rome as it conquered the world was that when it conquered a new country, if that country had any... If that country was pagan and had a, its own system 
of idols and worship that did not already exist in pagan Rome, then they would take those idols, they would even take the priests of that particular um, worship service, and they would take them back to the city of Rome, and they would build a new uh, department or room in the Pantheon Temple, and they would raise up, or at least establish and um, preserve that pagan worship there, and as the historian said, sometimes they even began to worship them themselves. The Pantheon Temple is the the premier temple of paganism in pagan Rome, and one of the reasons that pagan Rome is known as pagan Rome is because of this practice of exalting paganism by receiving and accepting every new pagan deity and worship service that it came in contact with. That wasn't simply because pagan Rome was pagan, it was because pagan Rome was the greatest promoter of paganism that we call it pagan Rome. It lifted up and exalted paganism through this practice. So back to verse 31. Remember, there's no sacrifice connected with daily. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary strength, and shall take away the daily. And they shall place the abomination that make it desolate, and from the time that the daily shall be taken away, and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So, We've established some points. Maybe you're, you haven't realized it, but we have been making points to come back into these verses. And these verses, Daniel 11:31 and 12:11, could read, "And pagan Rome shall stand on his part, and pagan Rome shall pollute the sanctuary strength, strength, and pagan Rome shall take away the daily, and pagan Rome shall place the abomination that make it desolate. And from the time that the daily shall be taken away by pagan Rome, and the abomination that make it desolate set up, thousand two hundred ninety days." And pagan Rome shall stand up for the papacy. And pagan Rome shall place the papacy. And by pagan Rome, the daily shall be taken away by pagan Rome. And the papacy set up. And from the time that the daily shall be taken away by pagan Rome and the papacy set up shall be 1290 days. And pagan Rome shall stand up for the papacy. And pagan Rome shall pollute the city of Rome. And pagan Rome shall take away the daily, and pagan Rome shall place the papacy. And from the time the daily shall be taken away by pagan Rome, and the papacy set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And pagan Rome shall stand up for the papacy, and pagan Rome shall pollute the city of Rome, and pagan Rome shall remove the daily, and pagan Rome shall place the papacy. And from the time the daily shall be removed by pagan Rome, and the papacy set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. That's what these verses are teaching us. Now, if we're going to factor in paganism, as the pioneers understand it, these verses say, and pagan Rome shall stand up for the papacy, and pagan Rome shall pollute the city of Rome, and pagan Rome shall remove paganism, and pagan Rome shall place the papacy, and from the time that paganism is removed by pagan Rome, and the papacy set up, there should be 1,290 days. Now, how does pagan Rome remove paganism? <clears throat> the Great Controversy, page 54. In the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. When's the 6th century? That's in the 500s. That's where these dates, 508, 538, 533, are found, are in the 6th century. In the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city, and the bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. When? 533. We should know that date. We should know that date. Paganism had given place to the papacy. The dragon had given to the beast his power, seat, and his great authority. Revelation 13.2. Paganism had given place to the papacy in this century. It happened. In fact, it happened at the beginning of this century. Somehow, paganism had been removed. It had been replaced with papalism, which is nothing more than paganism with a Christian profession. Signs of the Times, November 21st, 1899. Through paganism and then through the papacy, first paganism, then through the papacy, Satan exerted his power for many centuries in an effort to block from the earth, God's faithful witnesses. 
Now, this is Uriah Smith again, I believe, and it says, and they shall take away the daily sacrifice. It was shown on Daniel 8, 13 that sacrifice is a word erroneously supplied, that it should be desolation, and that the expression denotes a desolating power of which the abomination of desolation is but the counterpart and to which it succeeds in point of time. The daily desolation was paganism, and the abomination of desolation is the papacy. But it may be asked how this can be the papacy since Christ spoke of it in connection with the destruction of Jerusalem. And the answer is, Christ evidently referred to the ninth of Daniel, which is the, a prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem, and not to this verse of chapter 11, which does not refer to that event. Daniel in the ninth chapter speaks of desolations and abominations, plural. More than one abomination, therefore, treads down the church. That is, so far as the church is concerned, both paganism and the papacy are abominations. But as distinguished from each other, the language is restricted, and one is the daily desolation, paganism, and the other is preeminently the transgression or abomination of desolation, papalism. How was the daily or paganism taken away? And this is spoken of in connection with placing or setting up of the abomination or the papacy. It must denote not merely the nominal change of the religion of the empire from paganism to Christianity, as on the conversion so-called of Constantine, but such an eradication of paganism from all the elements of the empire that the way would be all open for the papal abomination to arise and assert its arrogant claims. Such a revolution as this plainly defined was accomplished, but not for nearly 200 years after the death of Constantine. Uriah Smith asking the question here, how, how is paganism take away? And Uriah Smith knows full well that in verse 31, it's pagan Rome that takes away paganism. He's, he, we've been using him as, as our historical point of reference to, reference to establish his things. How He's asking the question, how does Pagan Rome take away paganism. And he's still continuing. As we approach the year 508, we behold a grand crisis ripening between Catholicism and the pagan influences still existing in the empire. Up to the time of the conversion of Clovis, king of France, 496, the French and other nations of Western Rome were pagan, but subsequently to that event. To what event? To the conversion of Clovis in 496. And what's the conversion of Clovis in 496? It's when a king that had previously been the greatest resistor to Catholicism, changed his profession and began to go to work to place the papacy on the throne of the earth. And Clovis is a type of the United States. If you want to even get a little bit you know, more direct, Clovis is a type of Ronald Reagan. Before the Reagan years, it, you could still officially say that the greatest resistance to Catholicism was Protestant America. But in the Reagan years, the king changes his profession and begins to go to work to place the papacy upon the throne of the earth. That's who Clovis, king of France, is uh, prefiguring, but he's also representing all of the seven European kings. Up to the time of the conversion of Clovis, king of France in 496, the French and other nations of Western Rome were pagan. But subsequently to that event, the efforts to convert idolaters to Romanism were crowned with great success. The conversion of Clovis is said to have been the occasion of bestowing upon the French monarch the titles of Most Christian Majesty and Eldest Son of the Church. Between that time, between 496 and 508, by alliances, capitulations, and conquest, the Aborici, the Roman garrisons in the West, Brittany, the Burgundians, and the Visigoths were brought into subjection. From the time when these successes were fully accomplished, namely 508, the papacy was triumphant so far as paganism was concerned. For though the latter doubtless retarded the progress of the Catholic faith, yet it had not the power, if it had the disposition, to suppress the faith and hinder the encroachments of the Roman pontiff. When the prominent powers of Europe gave up their attachment to paganism, it was only to perpetuate its abominations in another form, for Christianity as exhibited in the Catholic Church was and is only paganism baptized. In England, Arthur, the first Christian king, founded the Christian worship on the ruins of the pagan. R Rapin, who claims to be exact in the chronology of, event, of the event, states that he was elected monarch of Britain in 
508. And he was the last of the seven European kings to bow to Rome. Clovis was the first in 496. And one by one they bowed. And the last of the seven European kings bowed in 508. And their bowing to Rome included bringing their civil governments into alignment, combination of church and state with the papacy, and dedicating their armies to the use of the papacy, and removing the legal profession of paganism from their civil governments and replacing it with the legal profession of Catholicism. By 508, these seven European kings, though pagan, had removed paganism from the continent. Amen. So, that's, verses, that's verse 31 of Daniel 12, Daniel 11, and Dan, in verse 11 of Daniel 12. So let's turn there and try to bring these to a close, and let me try to tell you what I was hoping to establish just then. <clears throat> I believe the daily is paganism. I believe William Miller and the pioneers and those that gave the judgment hour message were correct. I don't believe they understood everything about the daily. I think they did not, they weren't making a distinction on the two words take away. They were accurate on their understanding of the verses, but they weren't going to make the distinctions between sir and room that we're going to make. But nevertheless, the Lord guided them, and uh, I certainly couldn't have dug out what they, they've dug out. So. No criticism, but the Lord's been unfolding this truth. And in verse, verse 31, where we find the daily of Daniel 11, it says in arms, that's, the, that's Roman, pagan Rome, pagan Rome. Pagan Rome in the previous verse, the last part of verse 30, had intelligence with the papacy, those that forsook the Holy Covenant. That's where the story of pagan Rome as being the subject of Daniel 11 comes to its end, is in verse 30. As soon as they have the intelligence with pagan Rome, they cease to be the subject. Now, it doesn't, doesn't mean um, that they're out of it. It's just now we're going to discuss the papacy. And you come to verse 31. It says, an arm shall stand on his part. The his part here is the papacy. The military strength of pagan Rome is going to come to the aid of the papacy. And they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. The city of Rome is part of the prophetic testimony. And what the, the Daniel wants us to understand here is in this process, of pagan Rome placing the papacy on the throne of the earth. Part of the story is the city of Rome, and it gets polluted, it gets corrupted, it gets um, attacked, whether it's by the barbarians or whether it's just the, the insult to the city of Rome that Constantine put upon it when he chose Constantinople over Rome. It doesn't matter which way you want to take it, or if it's the last battle at Rome that drove the Goths out of the city, the city of Rome got polluted, and verse 31 is saying so. And shall take away, remove, this is sir, this means remove, the daily. It's going to remove paganism. It's going to remove paganism, as we just read, by removing the, the legal profession of paganism. It's going to also um, be used, its military strength, to remove the three horns of the Huroli, the Ostrogoth, and the Vandals. There was a question about this last night. We know the reason those three horns had to be removed is because they held um, the, the doctrine of Arianism. They professed in, the, in their Christian fear, they, sphere, they professed to be Christians in the, in the same, same definition of Christians as Catholicism, but they held uh, along with that fallen Christianity, the, the Arian teaching, and the argument was over the Trinity and how you related to the Trinity. So the question was posed to me, how can we say that these three horns that were removed are pagans if they were Arians, if they were Arian Christians? And I would suggest to you that that was their manifestation of Christianity. That was the argument that they were having with Rome. But these are still the ten horns of pagan Rome that were their basic foundations that they were all pagan nations. And when Christianity starts to walk in there and take over paganism, three of those horns... Um, fight over the issue of the Trinity, and they have to be removed. And that's part of what taking away paganism was all about, too. And I think it's William Miller. Correct me if I'm wrong, Brother Duane. No, it's not William Miller. Um, it's Wiley. Well, you correct me. I'm, it's it's in, just floating around in my mind. There, there's a historian or William Miller that points out that another 
historical proof that the daily was removed by 508 is that the, the, what's the highest form of worship in pagan worship? What's the highest ceremony you can do in pagan worship? Human sacrifice, and the historians point out, whether it's William Miller or Wiley, Miller. okay, William Miller points out that by the year 508, there was no longer any human sacrifices in Europe. The, the pagan religion had been so suppressed that they could no longer perform the highest um, ceremony that they liked to do. So in that sense, paganism had been removed from the continent as well. And... And in verse 31, in the process of removing the, this profession of paganism and bringing into subjection the religion of paganism and removing the three pagan horns of the Uruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, they placed the papacy on the throne of the earth. And then in verse 11 of chapter 12, it says, And from the time that the daily shall be taken away, removed, from the time that paganism is removed, when was pa paganism removed? 508. There will be 1,290 years, which brings you to 1798 because it begins in 508. And we'll have to deal with that later. So now, that's what I was trying to share about the daily and taking away um, in that last presentation. We're now moving on to the next presentation and we'll get a little ways into it, but not all the way. Repeat and enlarge. I hope we're all familiar with this rule. Um, Daniel chapter 2 gives us the basic kingdoms of Bible prophecy, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Daniel 7 repeats those kingdoms of Bible prophecy, but it enlarges upon them. And from my understanding, when Daniel 7 is enlarging upon those kingdoms of Bible prophecy, he's presenting the political aspect of those kingdoms of Bible prophecies. These are the beasts. It's... Uh, describing the, the political, military, government, civil, however you want to express it, um, power and movements of these kingdoms of Bible prophecy. And Daniel 8 repeats this kingdom of Bible prophecy, but it doesn't deal with the political aspect of these kingdoms of Bible prophecy. It deals with the religious aspect. You may not remember it. We will deal with it a little bit more. And I, it's, this is simple, but I, I want to put it in our heads. The kingdoms of Bible prophecy, the beast, or the, the powers of Bible prophecy, the beast, the dragon, the false prophet, they have two aspects to them, and I'm dividing them in half right here. That's what I'm doing. They all have a religious and a political side. Religious and political. Religious and political. Uh, Catholicism's religion is Catholicism. Catholicism, it's political is a monarchy. The religion of the dragon is spiritualism. The politics of this dragon is socialism. The religion of the false prophet is Protestantism. Even when it goes into apostasy, it's still apostate Protestantism. And the political manifestation of the false prophet is a democracy or a republic, however you want to call it. But in Daniel's visions, in Daniel chapter 2, 7, and 8, first we see the kingdoms of Bible prophecy in the simplified fashion, then Daniel 7 repeats upon that, and it deals with those kingdoms of Bible prophecy, and it presents their political aspect. In Daniel chapter 8, it moves into the same kingdoms of Bible prophecy, but it approaches them from their religious aspect. And the combination of church and state is the theme that runs from the beginning, one of the themes that runs from the beginning of Bible prophecy until the end. In Genesis 11, we've mentioned this before, we find in the very... Um, first testimony of Babylon ba in the story of Babel that what Nimrod did was build a tower in a city, a tower representing uh, the church, city, the state. Isaiah 14, uh, dealing with Satan. Satan had a desire to sit upon God's throne, his political authority, and also to sit in the sides of the north, which is his religious authority. From the very beginning, even in heaven, um, God's kingdom is identifying as having a political aspect and a religious aspect, and Satan wants to control both aspects. The, the story of combination of church and state runs through Bible prophecy, and because of that, um, we need to acknowledge that in our studies because there is light that comes from recognizing that Bible prophecy is dealing with church and state. And um, Daniel 2 has this same theme in it, uh, the iron and clay, 
in the feet, Sister White says, symbolizes churchcraft and statecraft. You do not need Sister White to demonstrate this. The Bible teaches that iron, the iron kingdom, iron symbolizes civil government. When Jesus is going to rule the world, he's going to rule the world with a rod of iron. And the iron kingdom, uh, I know, I'm sure we all know that each of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy contributed a certain uh, thing to the culture of mankind. Um, the Babylonians contributed the sciences. Medes and Persians invented the, the um, financial structure that still exists in the world. Greece, uh, the philosophies that still exist in the world. And what was it that Rome contributed to the world? Civil government. Rome is the Iron Kingdom. Uh, pagan Rome contrib contributed civil government to the world. And then the papacy represents um, man's uh, religion, clay. Clay in the Bible, God is the potter, we are the clay. We are the, we are the human vessels. And so clay symbolizes our relationship to God. It re re represents church. Iron represents state. That's why Sister White says the iron and clay in Daniel 2 represents churchcraft and statecraft that takes place at the end of the world. And that's not what we're dealing with at this point. I'm simply trying to say that the combination of church and state pervades Bible prophecy from Genesis from heaven, from heaven to Genesis and into Daniel. Revelation 13, the image of the beast. What's the image of the beast? It's a combination of church and state. Revelation 17, the story about the judgment of the whore. She's judged because she commits fornication with the kings of the earth. The kings, the civil power, the whore, the religious power. Combination of church and state from beginning to end. And in Daniel 7, we have the political aspect of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. State. In Daniel 8, we have the religious aspect of these same kingdoms, church. And that's why when Daniel's dealing with Daniel 8, he uses so many words that come from the sanctuary. He's trying to tell us as the readers, as the students, understand these kingdoms of Bible prophecy in Daniel 8 from their religious aspect. And the book that we handed out at the very beginning is going to give you much information on this. Um, this, this, the book, The Mystery of the Daily that we handed out, um, deals with Daniel 8. That's what it's dealing with. And in Daniel 8, we see a ram, which is a sanctuary animal, a goat. We see horns that come from the sanctuary. We see the word daily, which means continual. It, not means continual. The word that is translated as daily is continual. And it is used many times in the Old Testament when it's dealing with the sanctuary service. As we've already stated, the word take away, room, is used in the sanctuary when the priests would lift up a wave sheaf offering. They would lift up and exalt that offering. Of course, we have the cleansing of the sanctuary, God's sanctuary. That's a sanctuary term, Kodesh, the host. You never find the host separated from the sanctuary in God's word, from his sanctuary. And you even have in Daniel 8, an implied priest and an implied sacrifice. And you, it'd, be, it'd be hard to get to that level here, but it's very well documented in the book, Mystery of the Daily. And because this offering and priest that lifts up the offering is woven into Daniel 8, um, that kind of... Uh, Information in Daniel 8 is one of the reasons I believe some people stumble over their understanding of the daily because they end up seeing it as Christ's work in the sanctuary. And it's partly because there is some levels of understanding in Daniel 8 that are just absolutely amazing. And at one of the levels of understanding, there is the priest lifting up an offering that is seen between the lines, if that's the way to express it. So let's begin with Daniel 8. Verse 9, we will, get, we will read this. We'll have a, a, a little bit of the discussion behind us um, for our next presentation. Daniel 8, verse 8 and 9. What are we doing? What are we studying here? We're still studying the daily. I'm moving towards identifying the daily in Daniel 8. We've identified the daily in Daniel 11 and 12. We're identifying the daily in Daniel 8 differently because... The word take away in Daniel 8 is a different word than the word take away in 
chapters 11 and 12. So I take up chapters 11 and 12 on their own and try to establish them. And then I go into Daniel 8 and deal with the daily. It's still paganism. But in Daniel 8, paganism isn't removed. It's lifted up and exalted. So that's why I break them into two sections. So I, I, if you want to follow the logic and the order of this. But in verse 8, it says, Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. What does great mean here? Gadal, self-exaltation. Very, the very, if you miss Gadal in Daniel chapter 8, I mean, we, we put the sanctuary terms here in the previous slides, but I didn't put Gadal in it because I hadn't planned to mention it. That came up as kind of an afterthought the other day. But Gadal um, definitely, it's not necessarily in the sanctuary, but it's, it's definitely connected into the theme that Daniel 8 is about religion because it is the opposite of the true religion. Self-sacrifice, self-exaltation. Therefore, the he, go, the he goat waxed very great. He exalted himself greatly. And when he was strong, who is this? Alexander the Great. The great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Verse 9, and out of one of them, out of one of who? Out of one of them. Out of one of them who? Well, you've got to go back to the previous verse. It's either out of one of the four winds or one of the four horns. How do you know whether it's out of the winds or the horns, or does it matter? Out of one of them came forth a little horn, which was exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Oh, I did put it in here. Good, great, Gadol, self-exaltation. Here's uh, this increasing exaltation as we go down through Daniel 8's vision, the very fundamental um, foundation of what? What's this the foundation of? Paganism. Self-exaltation. That's, that's the fundamental religious principle of paganism is self-exaltation. And, you know, Daniel 8 starts in the Medes and Persians, but in reality, you can take this theme back into Babylon. Babylon was pagan and it was self-exalting. And the Medes and Persians were pagan, and they were even more self-exalting. And Greece was pagan, and it was even more self-exalting than that. And then came pagan Rome that ex exalted even more than all the previous. Why? Because it had the guts to try to kill Christ when he was born, and then did put him on the cross. And then the next power of Bible prophecy exalted himself even more, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This theme of Gadol runs through the entire chapter. So, here we go. Four notable ones or four winds? That's the question. Did the little horn come out of the four notable horns that came up out of Alexander's horn that was broken, broken or did it come from the four winds of heaven? Daniel begins to employ a method here that allows us <clears throat> to understand this. And here is the method. You see Daniel 8.8, 8, and the four notable ones is masculine. And sometimes, uh, for those of us that are English-speaking Americans, we are very unfamiliar with masculine and feminine. But the Latin-speaking brethren, and perhaps, I'm not sure, perhaps the German, the German, they have masculine and feminine too. How about um, Chinese? Chinese have masculine and feminine? Malaysian? Yes, so they, they understand it too. But the point is, Daniel begins to imply masculine and feminine to the words, and by doing so, he's going to make a very, very important distinction. He says in verse 8, the four notable ones, the four horns, they're masculine, but the four winds are feminine. So when you get into verse 9, it says, out of one of them, feminine, it tells you where they came out of. Where did they come out of? The four winds. The four winds. And why is this important? Well, it's important because it's in God's Word. It's important because it's in God's Word. Now, you can't, I can't, 
I, could, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have found this if I hadn't read that book, Mystery on the Daily. I, I wouldn't have picked this up from reading the English, but once it's discovered, it's for us and our children forever. But how, why is this important? I don't know how many souls Desmond Ford contributed to going off into darkness, but this is where one of the places where Desmond Ford went off into darkness. Because Desmond Ford believes that the little horn here, verse 9, it came out of one of the four horns of Alexander the Great. And he's very specific about this. This is why he doesn't believe the Pope of Rome can be the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. Because he believes that the Antichrist power that's portrayed as you move down through this history had to be a descendant, a direct descendant from Alexander the Great. He says the little horn came from one of these four broken horns. And because of that, it leads him off into darkness and with all his listeners go with him. But the pioneers never picked, the pioneers saw through this without recognizing the feminine or masculine, by the way, so you don't have to get to that level to be right. But we have light on this at this time, and we see that it is out of one of the four winds of heaven that the little horn comes from. Now notice, though, in the screen that the little horn, it says, out of one of them feminine came forth a little horn masculine. The little horn is going to be the subject of the next verses. And here, the little horn in verse 9 is masculine. And Daniel is going to do something very interesting. Because for the next four verses, in verse 9, the little horn is going to be masculine. But in verse 10, he's going to change it to feminine. In verse 11, he's going to go back to masculine. And verse 12, it's going to be feminine. That seems confusing. But let me ask you something. If we first agree that the little horn is Rome, okay? The little horn is Rome all the way through. If you, just on a very basic level, if, if you knew this was Rome and you had two Romes to choose from, and one of them was a man and one of them was a woman, which one would the woman of Rome represent? The church. That's how easy it is, and that's how it works out. When the little horn in these verses is masculine, it's dealing with pagan Rome. And when it switches to feminine, it's the church. It's papal Rome, and that's, that's the basic key to walking down through here. And we've reached this point um, where we need to close with prayer. So if you'll bow with me, we will do so. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to this point in our studies. And I believe this is very sacred ground. And if, if we reached here and we're taking a break at this time, I believe it's your will. I ask that you would let um, what we've been leading up to be retained in our minds so when we come back we can move forward on this and get a clear and simple and powerful understanding of these verses and of the daily and the significance of this symbol in the book of Daniel because we know that you told us in Matthew 24, 15 that we need to understand the abomination of desolation which includes the daily and we want to do so. We want to do so in such a way that we can teach it to others because the wise will be teachers. So we thank you for bringing us to this point. We ask that you'd go with us now as we um, break to eat lunch. We ask and thank you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>